Ronald Reagan used to like to tell jokes. He would tell stories, and he often told stories about himself or stories sort of on himself. And there was one he used to tell about a preacher, a minister in a small town who after decades of service to his community in which he became beloved, they, everybody in the town loved him, thought he was a, a, a good man, a great man, even a, a holy man. After many years, he died and his soul ascended to heaven. And um, the preacher was greeted at the pearly gates by St. Peter. And St. Peter was about to start explaining the rules in heaven and the accommodations and so on, when up comes another soul, up comes another soul. And it turns out that on the very same day from this very same small town, a politician had died. Now this politician was rather less beloved than the preacher, but somehow or other, there he is. So, the St. Peter, the guardian, the greeter at the pearly gates, uh, re-begins his orientation speech. And so he explains to the preacher and the politician, okay, these are the rules and we're here for all eternity and so on and so on and so on. And then he says, and now, I will show you to your accommodations. So they walk through the pearly gates, the preacher and the politician, led by St. Peter. And they walk into along the streets, and it turns out that in heaven, not all the streets are paved with gold. In fact, there are some kind of tough neighborhoods in heaven. And they walk down this one rather sketchy street and turn in an alley, and they come upon this nondescript uh, barracks, almost a jail-like building. And uh, the politician, who in his life he cut a few corners here and there, he's uh, thinking, oh my God, is this where I'm going to spend all eternity? The St. Peter takes them in the building and he shows them into, down this long hallway, into a, they turn into a room. And the room is just bare. It looks like, almost like a prison cell. It's got a chair and a small table and a cot and a small window up high and nothing else. It is as grim as could be. And the politician is just sweating. Oh my God, this is terrible. I thought I was going to be okay when I got to heaven, but is this what heaven's going to be like for all eternity? St. Peter turns to the two. And to the surprise of the politician, he says to the preacher, this is your home now. This is where you will be spending all eternity. The politician is flabbergasted and he just kind of wipes his brow. <laughs> Boy, I dodged a bullet there. And they leave the preacher there and they turn and they walk out of the building and out the alley. And then the politician starts getting second thoughts. He thinks, oh my gosh, if this is what the preacher, the holy man gets, what am I going to get? So they walk out of this neighborhood and as they walk out of the neighborhood, the streets start looking better and better. And in fact, they finally come, they turn a corner and there the streets really are paved with gold. And the accommodations, the residences on either side are these wonderful villas, these big mansions, and they turn corner and they go into this cul-de-sac and there is the finest mansion of all. And the politician is just scratching his head. What's going on here? And St. Peter takes him up to the front door, hands him the key and says, this is where you will be spending all eternity. And the politician is sort of scratching his head and thinking, is there a catch here or what's going on? And he doesn't know whether to speak up or just be quiet and accept, accept what seems to be his good fortune. But he can't resist. So he says to the, he says to St. Peter, do you mind if I ask you a question? And St. Peter says, sure, sure. And here in heaven, we're believe in full transparency. What do you want to know? And the politician says, so, you know, I'm a politician and I get this, and the preacher, the holy man, gets just that little, that small bare cell? I don't understand, what's the deal? 
St. Peter tugs at his long white beard and he says, you have to understand something about heaven. We've got lots of preachers here in heaven. You're the first politician who made it in. So Reagan used to tell this joke, and as I say, it was kind of a joke on Reagan himself, because Reagan was a politician. But Reagan, Reagan used humor as a political device, one might almost say a political weapon, because Reagan understood that if you're trying to warm up an audience, there's nothing like telling a joke. You can even get people's defenses to come down a little bit. If you can get people to laugh with you, even if it's just a kind of chuckle, chuckle kind of laugh, as one might expect out of this story, you're halfway to getting them to agree with you. So humor had been part of Reagan's repertoire, part of his arsenal for years when he became president of the United States. He needed the jokes even more when he became president of the United States after the 1980 election because Reagan portrayed a rather stern figure, even in some ideas, some minds, a frightening figure, especially as it related to American foreign policy. Because Reagan had run against Jimmy Carter in 1980 on a campaign of reviving the Cold War. Reagan was a longtime opponent of detente, and he contended that the United States had lost out to the Soviet Union during the years of detente. The Soviets, he said, had been cheating on the agreements, had been continuing to build up, and it was only the United States that had capped its arms race. And so, he said Reagan, the United States has something to do, some catching up to do. There was something else that Reagan needed to, uh, well, sort of to explain. Reagan especially after detente. Reagan was a different kind of president who had a different approach to foreign policy, in particular to the Cold War. Reagan was once asked by one of his aides, one of his assistants, so what's your, what's your policy on the Cold War? What's your attitude toward the Soviet Union and the Cold War against the Soviet Union? And Reagan said it's very simple. We win, they lose. Now, that sounds simple. But in fact, it was striking because American policy in the Cold War, ever since Harry Truman articulated the policy of containment, of containing the Soviet Union, was the, the policy was based on the idea that the United States didn't have to actively win the Cold War. The Soviet Union would eventually lose its momentum and the appeal of its message would fade away. The United States simply had to hold the line. And that's what containment was, all, containment was all about. That's what Truman did. That's what Eisenhower did. That's what Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, Carter did. But Reagan said, no, no. We win, they lose. That was his goal in the Cold War. So, Reagan decided to ramp up American military spending. Now, he had some assistance in this from Jimmy Carter. Carter, after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan had articulated something called the Carter Doctrine that said that the United States would not allow the Soviet Union to penetrate toward the Persian Gulf. But along with that came a request to Congress for a new increase in military spending. American military spending had been going down after the end of the war in Vietnam. And along with the philosophy of Carter's foreign policy of emphasizing human rights, rather than military responses to challenges, it continued to go down. So it was a real turnaround by Jimmy Carter to ask Congress for more money for the Pentagon. So, but Reagan kept it up. And Reagan spent his entire first term. Reagan would be a two-term president. Jimmy Carter had only been a one-term president. Reagan would spend his entire first term building up the American nuclear arsenal, the American Navy, basically letting the world know that the Pentagon is back in business. And the implication of this seemed to be that, all right, you know, if you're building these weapons, you must be building these weapons for some reason. So there's got to be a purpose behind this. And given the fact that Reagan brought into his administration some notable war hawks, these are the ones who believe in 
a military response to challenges overseas rather than a diplomatic or other kind of response. Reagan and people surrounding Reagan began talking as though a nuclear war might be winnable. Now, this was a big switch as well from the earlier days of the arms race because ever since the Soviet Union had acquired nuclear weapons in the very late 1940s and the arms race had gone on, there had been this accepted belief really on the part of most people in the United States and apparently on people in the Soviet Union as well that a nuclear war was not winnable. There were enough weapons around that both sides would destroy each other and nothing good could come out of it for either side. But some people associated with the Reagan administration and sort of kibitzing on the Reagan administration from the outside talked about the possibility that the United States might win a nuclear war, that the United States might be able either to strike first and paralyze the Soviet Union or the United States might be able to survive a Soviet strike and come out ahead. Now, this was really unnerving to all sorts of people because the, the reasoning behind this was pretty tenuous and it had a lot to do with what you consider to be acceptable losses. But the mere idea that the President of the United States might be thinking in terms of a war against the Soviet Union, this caused a great deal of alarm in the United States, more alarm than had been present probably since the Cuban Missile Crisis. And there were newspaper and magazine articles, there were made-for-TV movies, there were all sorts of scenarios drawn of what would happen should the nukes go off. So there was a great deal of alarm surrounding this. And Reagan seemed to be very unconcerned about the alarm. He would make jokes about it. In fact, once when he was going to go on the air and he didn't realize his microphone was live, he made a, a rather tasteless, ghoulish joke saying, and the bombing of Moscow will begin in 10 minutes. Well, Soviet leaders, hearing this, reading about all this, they had to ask themselves, is this guy serious? Is he preparing American and world public opinion for a nuclear war with all of the defense spending, all of the, the new nuclear weapons, and this kind of approach with their hearing about a nuclear war being winning and Reagan himself joking about it, they had to get concerned. And they indeed were concerned as the West discovered later. But the alarm bells really went off when Reagan announced something called the Strategic Defense Initiative. The Strategic Defense Initiative, or SDI, was a program, now, it wasn't even a program yet, it was an idea of anti-nuclear defenses in outer space. And this was something that had gotten into Reagan's head. He'd been talking to some scientists who thought that it might be possible to shoot down Soviet missiles in outer space. And Reagan was one who really believed that nuclear weapons were immoral at their very heart. That the idea of mutual assured destruction was utterly unacceptable. How can you hold hundreds of millions of people around the world hostage to the policies of the superpowers. And Reagan didn't like the idea that there was no defense against a Soviet nuclear strike. You know, we're smart people in the United States, said Reagan to himself and to other people. We ought to be able to figure this out. And there were some scientists, some physicists and others, who said, I think we can do it. Now, they had their own reasons for saying that. I mean, some of it was, some of it was actually sincere. But others I've had in mind, well, we're going to get some research money. There's these billions and billions and billions of dollars that are going to Pentagon. We ought to get some of that ourselves. But nonetheless, the Strategic Defense Initiative, SDI, was announced to the world. And Reagan said, we're going to start funding toward this program that's going to build this defensive shield. Now, exactly what it would look like, it was spoken of in metaphors as much as anything, like, like there was this umbrella, or sometimes it was an astrodome, a dome stadium over the United States. So this was the plan, and Reagan presented it as though it was very innocuous. It was this harmless thing. It was a defensive system. But people who had been thinking and talking about nuclear weapons and their strategies 
for decades realized, they knew right away, that anything that purported to be defensive defensive could nonetheless be very destabilizing. Suppose you are the leadership of the Soviet Union and you learn that the Americans are about to put up this defensive shield over the United States. Now, all of a sudden, MAD, Mutual Assured Destruction, no longer holds. They can shoot at us and we can't effectively shoot back at them. So it gives them an edge. And, for, and it's destabilizing because the Soviets, if they get wind that the Americans are building this, and Reagan announced to the world that the United States was going to begin research on this, the Soviets are going to be tempted to launch before the American defensive system becomes operational. Oh, but there was something else Reagan talked about. Once the United States develops this technology, the United States will share it with the world, specifically with the Soviet Union. And Reagan was probably sincere in this. He wasn't a particularly cynical person, and because his thinking was, all right, well, if we have a defensive shield, they should have a defensive shield too. And then, and then both sides will realize that a nuclear attack is a waste of time. And then maybe we can talk about dismantling some of the weapons, because if they can't get through, why do we need to build so many more? Anyway, so this is SDI. And there are all sorts of interpretations of SDI. So is it just to keep money flowing to the Pentagon and to the contractors that work for the Pentagon? Does Reagan sincerely believe this? There was another interpretation, and by the way, these interpretations, these explanations are by no means mutually exclusive. They could all be working at the same time. And one interpretation was that Reagan was basically upping the ante in the arms race in the belief that the United States could afford this new defensive system, but the Soviet Union could not. And finally, the Soviet Union would break, it would break the Soviet bank and the Soviets would have to fold their hand and Reagan, the United States, would win the Cold War. That was his strategy. So anyway, SDI gets underway and all sorts of people criticize Reagan for this and say, you know, do not take the arms race into outer space. This is just going to, you might break the bank of the Soviet Union, but it's going to break the bank of the United States too. Anyway, so this was the criticism of Reagan. But, and I should say that the, the weapons got built and the American nuclear arsenal had never been stronger and research was commenced on SDI. And while this was going on, Reagan was engaged in other areas of foreign policy that, well, when they became known, uh, brought a lot of criticism down on Reagan's head. One area was policy toward Iran. The United States had treated Iran as an international pariah ever since the Iranian Revolution, the seizure, the, the seizure of American hostages who had been released on Reagan's first day in office. The hostage holders in Tehran, the capital of Iran, had decided, okay, they're no longer serving any purposes, let's send them back. But the Iranian government liked to use the United States as this scapegoat, as this whipping boy, and would say that the great Satan, the name it gave to the United States, was conspiring against the Islamic Revolution and this and that. So, Iran looked on the United States as this great enemy. The United States, in public, looked on Iran as a great enemy and did whatever it could to contain the Islamic Revolution. But behind the scenes, something was going on. And that something was that the United States was trying to, or I should say, people operating on behalf of the United States were trying to find some moderate voices in Iran. There was a thinking in circles in the United States this Islamic, that, this is, that this Islamic revolution couldn't go on forever, that revolutions have their timetable, like the French Revolution became more radical and then eventually it moderated out and the revolutionary regime was overthrown. And so there was a hope that there were going to be some moderate voices in Tehran that the United States might be able to talk to. Meanwhile, Iran had been behind the kidnapping of some American diplomats, American nationals in Lebanon. And so, and they were operating through a proxy group, Hezbollah. So 
The Reagan administration is trying to arrange for the release of these American hostages at the same time that Reagan is saying, you know, we don't deal with hostages, we don't deal with terrorists, we don't negotiate with kidnappers. So Reagan is kind of working behind the scenes, or people operating on Reagan's behalf are operating behind the scenes, and one of the things that they are doing is selling American weapons to Iran. Iran has gotten engaged in a very bloody war against its neighbor, Iraq. Iran's military arsenal was mostly American-made, left over from the days when the Shah of Iran was America's ally, and the Shah bought a lot of American military equipment. So in this war, the American military equipment was wearing out, needed replacement parts, needed ammunition, and so on. And the United States officially had this embargo against sending any weapons to Iran. Uh, but working behind the scenes, the United States was secretly sending these weapons to Iran in hopes of getting the release of the hostages and of cultivating moderates in, in Iran and maybe undermining the Islamic regime there. So this is going on behind the scenes. Meanwhile, Reagan is waging another secret or at least covert campaign. Covert means we don't acknowledge it, even if much of the world knows it's going on. And that was a war against the Sandinista, the leftist government of Nicaragua. And Congress had tried to pull the reins in on the Reagan administration because Congress didn't want the United States to get involved into a Vietnam-like situation in Central America. But Reagan was insistent that the United States should support a group called the Contras, meaning against, a con the Contras, these insurgents against the leftist government of Nicaragua. And he wanted to do so even after Congress pulled the plug on funding. Congress is the one who's supposed to be the one in charge of spending. And Congress said, no, we're not going to spend any money on the Contras. But Reagan wanted to keep funding them. So what happened was there was a group in the White House, that arranged for the funding of the Contras from the proceeds of the sale, the secret sale of weapons to Iran. Eventually, the story broke, and the scandal became known, became known as the Iran-Contra scandal. Iran for the Iran side of the weapons, and Contras for the Nicaraguan Contras. And it was a huge embarrassment to Reagan because he was violating U.S. law. He was going against his own policy. And it seemed to indicate that Reagan couldn't be trusted, at least in this regard. Okay, so keep this going on in the background. This is something that for a while it's unknown, then there were rumors that it's going, and finally it bursts in the open. But meanwhile, Reagan has apparently changed his policy toward the Soviet Union, or that's what it looked like. Reagan in his first term was all about building up the American nuclear arsenal and confronting the Soviet Union. In his second term, Reagan reaches out to Soviet leadership and tries to find somebody to talk to so that perhaps maybe a start can be made on reducing the nuclear arsenals on either side. Maybe, maybe bringing this Cold War to a conclusion of some sort. Reagan tried to reach out to Soviet leadership, but Leonid Brezhnev, who'd been there for a long time, he died. And then his two successors came in and they died quickly as well. It was only at the beginning of Reagan's second term, he was reelected in a very large victory, a landslide in 1984, that Reagan found somebody in the Kremlin, in, the, in Moscow, uh, who, who would talk. And this individual was Mikhail Gorbachev. Gorbachev was young by the standards of Soviet leadership, and he had in mind reforming the Soviet system. He was not an anti-socialist, he was not an anti-communist, but he looked at the performance of the Soviet economy, looked at just the way things worked and didn't work in the Soviet Union, and he concluded that changes were needed, changes were in order. So he launched this reform program that involved opening up the getting something closer to freedom of speech so that he could find out what was going on. One of the problems about a one-party system, one-party government is that government officials, they run the risk of hearing only the things that their subordinates think they want to hear. And 
It's tough to bring bad news to the people at the top. One of the principal arguments for freedom of the press, freedom of speech, of using the press as a watchdog on government is that the press then will have an incentive to tell you what's wrong, what's going on, what needs to be fixed. So Gorbachev institutes more of this, this openness regarding the press and regarding outside opinions. And he also embarks on various structural reforms to try to alleviate the roadblocks within the Soviet bureaucracy. So basically what he's trying to do is to bring the Soviet system into the modern era because it has become, it's suffering somehow from a kind of hardening of the arteries. It's been around for a long time and it's just not responsive to anything. Furthermore, Gorbachev, well, Gorbachev, doubtless hadn't heard of Brands's fourth law that says foreign countries get the foreign policy they can afford, but he understood its implications, and that is that the Soviet Union could not afford a continued arms race with the United States. The Soviet Union was a military superpower, but it was an economic comparative pipsqueak. So Gorbachev is trying to figure out how to, how to improve Soviet performance. And one of the things he does is he reaches out to Reagan. He realizes it would really help the Soviet system if we didn't have to spend so much on the military. By this time, Reagan is preaching arms control and arms reduction as well. Now, there are a lot of people who interpreted Reagan's, what seemed to be Reagan's about face as, well, this is what presidents do in their second term. But, you know, because they're looking to the history books. And this was a big change. There are others who say, and I, I think this is persuasive, that with Reagan it wasn't really a change of heart so much as a change of tactics in the same underlying strategy. That Reagan wanted to achieve arms control, but he believed that the only way to bring the Soviets to the table to negotiate seriously was to demonstrate that the United States would spend absolutely as much as necessary to maintain equality or even achieve superiority over the Soviets. So they had to have an incentive to come and bargain. And then, of course, he needed somebody on the other side who would be willing to talk. And Gorbachev was just his guy. And in a series of meetings, they get to know each other, and they begin to sense that the one on the other side, Reagan on the American side, Gorbachev on the Soviet side, that they're serious about arms control. They, they have a meeting, a meeting in the Iceland capital of Reykjavik in the autumn of 1986. And they gather there and they basically tell most of their aides to leave the room. And they talk one-on-one. -on -one. They have uh, interpreters. Um, but beyond that, they have, it's just the two of them. And uh, they talk seriously about what's this vision? What could we do? And, each, and, it, and as the talk goes on, it goes on for uh, a weekend, Saturday and Sunday. And the more they talk, the more they get to know each other, the more they come to trust each other, the more they're sharing what they recognize as the needs of the other. And it's as though each one is trying to do the other one better in what can we do to eliminate the threat, the scourge of potential nuclear war that hangs over humanity. And they reach a point where they're very, they're very nearly agreeing to eliminate all the nuclear weapons on either side. And the one sticking point, the one thing that keeps them from agreeing is SDI, Reagan's Outer Space Defense Program. Reagan has said in public that he's not going to bargain away SDI because people who conservatives, uh, some of Reagan's critics by now, who think that Reagan might be taken advantage of by Gorbachev, say you can't give up SDI. So Reagan's determined he's not going to give up SDI. But Gorbachev needs to contain SDI because he doesn't want to get in an outer space arms race. So they come very close, they come very close to an agreement, they, but they can't finally get that agreement on SDI. And the meeting falls apart. The two of them walk out of the meeting and you can see on their faces, you can look in the photographs, you can see on their faces that they're really disappointed. They had come so close. Now maybe they weren't as close as they thought. Maybe they couldn't have gotten a deal, actually, couldn't have gotten the, de the details of the deal worked out. Maybe they couldn't have gotten it through their respective governments. Um, but anyway, but it, for a moment it seemed as though the end of the arms race, maybe the end of the nuclear era was in sight. They didn't get that. But they did get something less, but not insubstantial. In 1987, Reagan and Gorbachev got together 
and they signed something called the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, the INF Treaty, which outlawed, banned an entire category of nuclear weapons. These are the ones that don't, aren't as long range as the intercontinental missiles, but they were important nonetheless. They were important for what they did and in Europe, which is where they're mostly located, but also for what they represented. The two sides can actually come to a big agreement. And this was the beginning of, well, one could say this was the beginning of the end of the Cold War. We'll see the end of the end of the Cold War in the next lecture.